Hello friends, for today's video it's going to be another new fantasy releases wrap up. As always I'll have timestamps in the description bar down below if you'd like to skip ahead to any one particular book. I am going to start with Untethered Sky. I haven't yet had a chance to talk about this one in a new fantasy releases wrap up but I did mention it in a couple other videos so some of you have probably heard me talk about it already so if you'd like to go ahead and skip ahead feel free to do so. The other two books that I'll be talking about would be Chaos and Flame and Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, which I feel like I can't even say its name without smiling and being excited and happy because I liked it, spoiler alert. But anyway, uh, I'll go ahead and start with Untethered Sky. I actually quite liked this one too. It made my top fantasy for the second quarter. It is a novella, so it's going to be much shorter than a lot of the other fantasy works that I think a lot of us end up picking up. And short works in fantasy can be very difficult because so often we are accustomed to or wanting to really feel immersed in these fantasy worlds and in order to feel that way it often takes a lot of time to establish the magic, to establish the culture, to establish the world itself. And when you take that page count out, you still have to tell a satisfying story. You you still have to have characters that generally the readers are going to either connect with or find some kind of, find them to be vehicles of the themes and things like that. And then, because it's fantasy, it's still expected that you deliver on the fantastical elements. And for a lot of people, I imagine that this is not going to be the case because it is so short, and that is part of the reason that novellas in fantasy are so difficult for so many people. For me, this one succeeded. I really quickly felt for the character. I very quickly wanted her to attain everything she was going after to reach these goals that she had for herself. The setup for the story is it's a world where there are these manticores that harm people and they're essentially like wildlife that harms a lot of villagers, especially people that live in more rural areas and things like that. And that very thing did happen to our main character and some people that she cared about. And so after having seen what the manticores were capable of, she really sets off on this path to become somebody who is bonded to, not in a magical way, but just in a animal companion to person kind of way, to something called a rock, which are these massive falcons. And these are really the only animals that can fight against the manticores, but to become somebody who is very connected with these animals, it it's very difficult, sometimes it's very unsuccessful, and thus our main character has a lot in store for her as she pursues this path. But just following her, just this pursuit of this path of bonding this rock, and then fighting these manticores, and then some of the personal relationships that develop along the way, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was just the right amount of time for this story. You do cover a lot of her life in a pretty short amount of pages, but I didn't really feel like there were these massive gaps. I didn't feel like we were missing important vital information that would have been pertinent to the story or to her development. I always felt like we got just enough. And for me, it felt very cinematic uh, on my side channel, Full Meta Analysis, where I talk about comics, manga, video games, those sorts of things. I've done a couple of videos talking about fantasy that I think would make, or books in general that would make good movies. And I rarely think that movies are the right route to go because I'd find that you you end up having to cut way too much usually. And it's not, that's why so, so often the joke is the books are always better because you get to understand the characters more. You get to be with everybody for a long amount of time. And it just doesn't end up getting delivered often in movie, which in movie format. So that's why usually shows or <laughs> video games, in my case, I love video games, uh, are the better route. However, I wish I had mentioned this one when I did those videos. I didn't. I listed a bunch of other books. But this one I think would make a fantastic movie. Every time I've talked about it, I have said it felt cinematic. It just felt like I was watching a movie. I could visualize the hunting. I could visualize the rocks. I could visualize the landscape where everything was transpiring. I really liked it. I thought it was just the right amount of time. So I, I thought it was great. However, I can still completely understand some people feeling like the ending is too abrupt, which it was kind of abrupt but I could see people just feeling like it needed more. When I talked about it previously, and I wanna say again, that what I would love is for Fonda Lee to write a full 
either a full novel or a series in this world and have this story be referenced or have this be something that is considered lore within the new series, but then you can go back and read it. And I think that would be incredible because I really liked this world. So I would love to see more. But for now, that novella was, uh, whoops, sorry. My, my book bumped the camera. Uh, for now, it was great and I, I really liked it. After that, we have Chaos and Flame. I did not really like this one. But I'm so sad because I feel like it had so much potential. And I always feel like that's the that's such a mean thing to say. Like, it was almost good. That's and that's not even true. You know, it's it's a matter of opinion and what you like. But the the parts that I was captivated by within this story were not the things that ended up really coming to the forefront. It was all the things that I wasn't enjoying as much that started to be the main the main thing driving the story forward. So the setup is that you have these two brothers that have a very tenuous hold on power. And they are currently ruling in an area that is kind of the most powerful of all these different warring factions, you could say. And the one brother who is actually the one in charge, he seems a little uh, off. <laughs> He, you gather as a reader very quickly that he clearly has some gift of foresight, but what that entails and how detailed it is, is not the clearest, but he is very eccentric and he is not really fulfilling his role as leader. And he's starting to lose some of the, the faith that other generals and such things have put in him. And so it seems like there's a chance that they could be taken out, betrayed, things like that. And then the younger brother is the one who's been on the battlefield and he's been trying to protect his brother's reputation. He understands this foresight that his brother has been gifted with, but he also doesn't really know it in all of its individual details. He doesn't really know why his brother seems so preoccupied. At some point he's like, okay, but you need to rule. So he's trying to kind of protect his brother, keep his brother secret and be on the battlefield. And this young woman ends up coming into the picture who seems as though she came from one of the fallen houses and she is the person that the brother, who's the leader, he has seen this woman in his vision and he's been painting her and he's been painting very specific images of her and then she shows up and suddenly it's like, okay, she must be someone important. So let's capture her and bring her in. And she is forced to cooperate for a long time because they have held someone she cares about hostage. So she's kind of having to be forced to work with these brothers. And it would seem that the one wants to offer her all of these things, give her a title and things that you wouldn't expect. And you're like, what's going on? What does he know? And it, it is fun to have that mystery of the character that knows more than you because then you're kind of trying to figure out their plan. And I really like that. Except I did feel like to some degree, that is the most fun when you can kind of piece together what might uh, be their plan. And in this case, you kind of just were like, I guess I'm just along for the ride. But the part that really took me out of the story was the, it's almost the faded lovers trope to some degree where you have these two characters that seem like they're instantly falling in love. They're instantly attracted to each other. And they just, in a way that's like, it's like the stars collide <laughs> where it just feels so melodramatic and over the top. And that is the case with two of the characters in this. And I, I am all for a good enemies to lovers. I'm all for these characters that are on opposing sides. And by coming together, they recognize each other's differences, each other's strengths. They understand the other side more. It's opening their worldview. Like that, I think when done well is incredible. But <laughs> I don't like when it's like, you have my dad figure held hostage, but also you're pretty hot. And I'm just, I don't like that <laughs> because it cheapens it to me. Like the thing that makes it great is the amount of depth that you can just really dig out in these sorts of scenarios where you're having people whose worldviews are being challenged by the other side. And that's not quite what's happening. What's happening is like, for some reason, I find myself really enjoying sparring with him and you're just like, ah. or like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to have to do because he's just so attractive. And 
I don't care for that. And it it became such a big deal in the story. And I'm like, I like learning about the different houses. And I like seeing the interesting way in which the magic works. And I like trying to figure out, I think that person in this house is trying to betray this person. And I think this person is trying to manipulate them. And that part of the story, which is there, I thought was really engaging. So this is one of those books where had those other things not been present, I might have DNF'd it. But those other things, I'm like, okay, when we pause the angst, that other stuff is so interesting and done quite well but then the angst just got so turned up that i was like ah i don't i don't care <laughs> i would rather there was no romance or that it had taken much more time to develop or like because i don't mind if they notice the person's attractive but there's a difference between noticing someone's attractive and then being like oh boy i don't know what i've gotten myself into because because they're attractive and you're just like what <laughs> anyway sorry i'm getting kind of worked up. I I still think that, um, you know, if angst is not a, is, is not bothersome to you, or if you kind of like that feeling of, like, faded lovers, they can't even understand why they just feel so compelled to be around this person and talk to this person and get to know this person. If you like that in a story, then you're probably going to eat that book up. And if you like the mix of all those other things that I was reading for, then it's going to be the perfect book for you. But for me... The other stuff, I just wanted it dialed back, you know? I wanted it dialed back. Now to Yumi. I loved Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. <laughs> so I did do an entire, which I've been doing for pretty much all of the Cosmere books this year and Sanderson's Secret Projects. Uh, I did do a spoiler discussion with some of my friends. So I'll have that linked. And I I mean, I think this is one. I, I loved it. I, I should just try to say something coherent here. But... I'll have that linked if you'd like to see spoilers and get to partake in the discussion. And we do kind of touch on some Cosmere stuff at the end. But anyway, Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, when I first started it, I wasn't sure. I thought, eh, I don't know. I'm not, I, the world is really interesting, but so far I, I don't know that I care that much, but it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'll keep going. And I do want to say that the world is one of my absolute favorites that I've come across by Sanderson. The world is interesting in that you do see two different settings and one, it just feels very much like darkness. And as we discussed in the video, it's almost like Tokyo at night. And it does feel much more modern than I think a lot of us are accustomed to. And then the other area is very desert-ish, like it's very dark and there is plant life, but, or excuse me, it's not dark, it's very dry is what I meant, the other one's dark. It's very dry. And there is plant life, but it doesn't seem to necessarily be growing the same way that we're accustomed to. And they also have things that are floating around. And our main character, Yumi, in this part of the setting, has this interesting connection with these spirits. And she draws them in through her art. And you get to explore what that art is. And then she calls on the spirits and requests favors on behalf of townspeople. And it very much feels like society is barely holding on, that it's kind of a very rural, underdeveloped area, and not through anybody being unintelligent or anything like that, but just purely how intense the setting itself is. It makes it very difficult to make these advancements when everybody is just barely surviving. And I think Tress, the first of the secret projects, also did a good job of having this really intense setting that also contributed to that survival, that need to understand your landscape completely in order to not die. <laughs> I think Tress was a little bit more brutal with how quickly something could go wrong, whereas in this area it was like this this dread of what's going to happen if we don't get the spirits to come and fulfill these wishes. And the wishes are like for light or to help them with the heat that's coming up off the ground and little things like that. Little things just to survive. So when you contrast that to painter is what they call the other character for a lot of the story. When you contrast that to painter's perspective, which feels much more sci fantasy, it feels much more modern. And clearly there's a lot of the modern luxuries like having basically your own apartment and a shower and things like that. It ends up 
being a really odd mix that you're like, what's going on? And then at some point, these characters' stories kind of collide through some unusual circumstances that does seem to involve this sort of mysterious magical component. And you wonder if it has something to do with what Yumi does, where she draws these spirits in, or if it has something to do with what Painter does. The reason he's called Painter is because there are these nightmare monsters, essentially, that can prey on people, and every every time they do, they get stronger and more corporeal, and thus it's important that the painters, that they are able to draw, similar to how Yumi draws spirits to her, the painters draw these nightmare beings to art, and painter is somebody who will paint something, and it sort of takes the shape of that thing, but if you don't catch them in time, they can become very powerful to a point where they can destroy entire cities. So there's a lot of theories that arise as you're reading, you're wondering, is where Yumi's from the remnants of a city that was destroyed by these nightmare beings? How come it's so bright and dry, where in Painter's world it's so dark and there is this sense of <laughs> lasting night all the time? And so you're, you're, it's fun to theorize, and then when these two characters come together, their lives are so different, their personalities are so different, that they butt heads, they challenge each other, and they're also trying to figure out how they can help one another so that they can go back to their own day-to-day -day lives. But in this forced proximity type of situation, they do get to know each other in a way that creates a very fun dynamic, and they... I just think their relationship building is really sweet. That's the main takeaway for me, is that this book is just so sweet. It's so sweet. The artwork is unbelievably beautiful. And I, of course, had a very strong attachment to the story, just purely on the fact that it is, it has some similarity similarities to Final Fantasy X. I noticed them immediately. <laughs> I was telling my husband, like, there's some things about this that remind me of Final Fantasy X. And then I finished the book, and then I saw that Sanderson said his biggest inspiration was Final Fantasy X. And I'm like, oh, dang it. <laughs> dang it, because I was like, I felt special for noticing. And then it just says it. But I have said for years that I want... Final Fantasy X in book form, but I also would need it to be unique enough where it doesn't feel like fan fiction. It feels like its own thing, which this absolutely did, but it having that inspiration from Final Fantasy X immediately, I just felt the, like the warm fuzzies. <laughs> I have such nostalgia for that game and for the way in which the characters, their, their connection to each other, to their own worlds, where they're from, the way they get to know each other, their various different professions within their worlds and everything, and then the greater world at, at large, you could say. Uh, I just think there's so much there that I did have that nostalgia. So I, I understand that a lot of people feel differently from one secret project to the next, but this one, I don't think that the next one could even beat it because I have that personal connection to the story I already thought it was great. I already loved the characters. I already loved the way that everything came together. But when you mix that with my love of Final Fantasy X, uh, I'm biased is what I'm saying. But I loved it. I loved it so much. I loved it so much. And it's funny because, like I said, when it first started, I was like, I don't know. And then the more I read, the more I fell in love. And then now as I sit with it, every time I think about it, I just have those warm fuzzies. I just love it. And that does make me curious for all of you. What are some books that when you finish them, you liked them or maybe even love them, but the longer you sit with them, the more that that love builds? I'm very curious to know, but that was Yumi for me. It's now going to hold a special place in my heart. <laughs> and the world is so interesting that I'm like, I want more sci fantasy. <laughs> I want more stories that are different in their settings than what we're we're accustomed to in fantasy. So anyway, absolutely adored it. Now we just have one more secret project. I can't wait. But anyway, that's it for some new fantasy releases. I will have purchase links in the description bar down below if you are interested in checking any of these out. But thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.